Sabrina guessed that most kids would love living among their favorite fairy tale characters, knowing Snow White lived down the street, or that the little mermaid was swimming in a river. In the river, might be a dream come true for some, but to Sabrina, it was more like a nightmare. Most of the fairy tale folks who now call themselves Ever Afters despised her family. The root of their hatred lay with Wilhelm, who, with the help of a decrepit old witch named Baba Yaga, constructed a magical boundary around the town to prevent a band of rebel Ever Afters from attacking nearby communities. The end result was the barrier, an invisible prison that trapped the bad Ever Afters, as well as the good and fairyport landing forever. Naturally, the townsfolk were bitter, but they failed to realize that Sabrina and her family were stuck in the town too. The spell would be broken if the grooms died or abandoned Fairport Landing, but with the st- steady stream of outlandish crimes to solve and a rogues gallery of monsters, lunatics, and evil witches to combat, the Wilhelm's descendants weren't going anywhere. Lately, ever after the resentment of the Grimms was at an all-time high, most of the bad feeling was fueled by the town's new mayor, the Queen of Hearts. Mayor Hart and her notorious Sheriff Nottingham had made it all too clear that humans, especially the Grimm family, were not welcome in Fairport Landing. They, re- they raised property taxes so high that they were impossible for most people to pay. Humans were forced to abandon their homes and leave town. When Granny and the family managed to scrape together the money for the tax bill, Hart and Nottingham tried another approach to rid themselves of the Grimms. They arrested the family's protector, Mr. Kenneth. Kenneth, who happened to be the big bad wolf, was dragged off to jail as a sheriff, mayor, and dozen more ever afters some of the family had considered friends, revealed themselves to be members of a shadowy group known as the Scarlet Hand. The head wanted nothing short of world domination, and they were also responsible for much of the family's grief. Led by the still mysterious master, they committed dozens of bizarre crimes, including the kidnapping and spellbinding of Sabrina and Daphne's parents. Staying one step ahead of the hand was a full-time job, one Sabrina's grandmother had undertaken with the help of Mr. Kenneth, and now they needed to find a way to get him back. There's Main Street! Daphne shouted above the wind. Seconds later, the flying carpet gently touched down inside an office building on the edge of town. Once everyone had stepped onto the sidewalk, the rug neatly rolled itself up and Daphne hoisted it onto her shoulder. Wait here, the pig snouted creature said. I'll scout the neighborhood. It's best to stay out of sight. There could be snipers in the trees. I'm sure there are no snipers, Granny started, but the little man raced off before she could finish. Sabrina and her sister followed the old woman down Main Street. It was particularly lonely that day. Many of the little shops that lined the street were shuttered and closed. The side walls, the sidewalks was empty and the roadway clear of cars. The town's one and only traffic light had been burned out. As far as Sabrina knew, Fairport Landing had never been a bustling centre of commerce, but there had been a time not so long ago when its little stores were filled with customers. Now the most were abandoned. Signs hung in windows declaring emergency liquidations and, after 150 years in business, were closing in our doors. Those that want her had a much more ominous sign in their windows. A blood-run handprint, the mark of the scarlet hand. One now hung on the door of Old King Cole's restaurant. Looks like they got to him too, Sabrina said, pointing out the sign. We're running out of places to eat in this town, so Daphne grumbled. Normally, Daphne's single-minded obsession with eating would have made Sabrina smile, but this girl was making a troubling point. The town was closing its doors to humans and any other actors who didn't join the skull at hand. Eventually, the family stopped outside of a small office building with huge picture windows and a manicured lawn. What are we doing here? Sabrina asked. I thought we were going to the jail. I don't think visiting the jail is a good use of our time, Granny said. Nottingham has been most uncooperative. We haven't seen Mr. Candace in a month, and it doesn't look like and it doesn't look like things are going to change. I've decided to hire someone who can help us. We're going to meet an ever after, aren't we? Sabrina said, looking at her sister. 
She knew that Daphne usually couldn't resist meeting fairy tale characters. She was known to squeal with delight and bite her hand when in the presence of one. I guess it won't be such a big deal that you're a grown up. No big deal at all, Daphne said, quite seriously. When the security guard returned and informed them that they were safe from snipers, the group went inside and climbed the stairs to the third floor of the building. There they found a group, a single door with a sign next to it that read, The Sherwood Group, Attorneys at Law. Sabrina scanned her memory for the name Sherwood, but nothing came to mind. Granny opened the door to the office and ushered the girls inside. There they found themselves in the middle of a chaotic battle. Sabrina saw a number of men wearing business suits, but they were acting far from professional. They were sword fighting, arm wrestling, drinking beer from tall ceramic cups, and singing a rambling English tune as loudly as possible. The lyrics seemed to be about fighting or stealing or combinations of both, and once one song was finished, the men immediately broke into another. Hello, Granny Rowler called out, but the men didn't seem to notice her. They kept up with their violent games, laughing at the top of their lungs. They seemed to be having a lot of fun, despite the fact that two of the men were standing on top of a desk, swords in hand, and slashing at one another. Each was an expert swordsman, and not a single blow found its mark. What was strangest about the two men was that each was laughing and complimenting the other on their deadly assault. I should get it. I should get you out of here. The family's bodyguard squeaked. These men are barbarians. Who are we fine? Grace assured the creature. I'm told that this is how they behave all the time. We're perfectly safe. Just then, a potted fawn flew past them and smashed against a wall. There was a loud cheer that suddenly died when the men noticed how close they had come to harming the family. Gentlemen, we have clients, a huge man with a dark, untamed beard shouted. He, we, he must have been more than six and a half feet tall, with a chest as wide as a car bumper and hands as big as basketballs. His eyes were deep set and fierce, giving him a war expression that was offset by his wide beaming smile. Welcome to the Sherwood Group. Welcome, the men shouted in unison as they held up their pints of beer. I have an appointment with Robin Hood, Granny said. Robin Hood, girls cried. Sabrina glanced at her sister, waiting for the little girl to squeal with happiness. But Daphne caught her looking. No big deal, huh? Sabrina asked. Daphne shook her head. It was obvious she was struggling to hold in her excitement. One of the sword fighting men leaped from the desk, thrust uh, his sword in a sheath, and rushed to take Granny's hand. He was a tall, handsome man, wearing a dark green pinstripe suit and sporting a red goatee and mustache. His wavy hair hung to his shoulders, framing a broad smile and bushy eyebrows that gave him a mischievous appearance. He looked like the man Sabrina had seen on the covers of romance novels. He kissed Granny on the hand. Welcome, I'm Robin Hood and these miserable lamps are my merry men. We're the Sherwood Group and we've been suing the rich and giving to the poor since 1987. That's the wrong timer. I think we still have like about five more minutes left. Anyways, let's continue. Chapter 2 Robin Hood and his barley companion led the family down the hallway and into an office lined with floor-to-ceiling windows offering an amazing panorama of the Hudson River. The sun was creeping over the mountains and its rays painted the waves a glittery gold. A tiny sailboat drifted by and a few hungry seagulls hovered over the water searching for breakfast. Robin Hood's office was tastefully decorated with framed law degrees and shelves of thick legal books. The only things that seemed out of place were a bow strung with a heavy cord hanging from a shelf above the door and a quiver of arrows leaning in the corner. Mrs. Grimm, please come in, the man said, helping the family into the leather chairs in front of a huge oak desk. The pig snapped to the creature, scooped, scouted the room, peeking into a potted plant beneath a leather sofa before it crossed its arms and stationed itself by the door. I apologize for the commotion when you came in, Robin said. You can take the men out of the forest, but you can't take the forest out of the men. Allow me to introduce my associate, Little John. Happy to meet you, the man roared. 
Sabrina reached out to shake his hand, but he swatted her on the back, and what he might just have thought was a friendly pair. It nearly knocked Sabrina out of her chair. Mr. Hood, these are my granddaughters, Sabrina and Daphne. Please call me Robin, he said as he bent over and kissed each girl on the hand. Sabrina nearly fainted. He was so handsome and kind. Her hands got sweaty and her heart started to race. She realized she was staring at him and worse, she couldn't seem to stop. I've heard quite a bit about the famous sisters Grimm, he continued, patting Sabrina on the head like she was a beagle. Then turning to shake Granny's hand. How can I help you, Mrs. Grimm? Robin, I need a lawyer, Granny rather said. Then you've come to the right place. My staff and I are all first-rate lawyers, though admittedly we got our degrees online. I hope that won't be a problem. Fairyport Landing doesn't have a law school or a college or even a high school, really. Robin took a seat and put his feet up on the desk, revealing a leather boot he wore instead of loafers. So, were you injured on a job? A victim of malpractice? Bought some toys with too much lead plate? Paint. Actually, I have a friend who has been arrested, Granny said. Robin and Little John shared a worried look. The wolf, Robin said, and suddenly as he sat up straight in his chair, we prefer to call him Mr. Kenneth, the old woman replied. He was arrested a month ago, and there are still no charges filed against him. The sheriff is also preventing us from visiting him. Little John stepped forward. That's unfortunate, Mrs. Grimm, but I'm not sure we can help. We're not criminal defense lawyers. He's right. We're litigators. Robin added, we sue companies that spill chemicals into rivers or make products that break, and we help people get settlements when they slip on the sidewalk. We've never argued a case in criminal court. You must have some training, Granny said. The only two criminal defense lawyers who lived in Fairport Landing were human, and as you know, the mayor has run most of us out of town. We're desperate. Robin Hood got from his desk and gazed out the window at the river. Little John joined him, and the two men talked in low voices for several moments. They seemed to be having an argument, but eventually the men nodded and shook hands. When they were finished, Robin and Little John turned back to the family. It would be impossible to reason with Nottingham, Robin said. He hates me even more than he hates you and your family. Hiring us will make your problems a million times worse, Little John replied. Sabrina looked over her, her grandmother. The old woman's hopeful expression began to feel, fade. Plus, if I help you, may heart will shut this office down by sunset, Robin said. Gray sighed with the feet and stood up. Sabrina and Daphne did the same. I understand. We won't waste any t- more of your time. Suddenly, Robin Hood leaped in front of them. I didn't say we wouldn't do it. You take the case? The old woman cried. We wouldn't pass this up for the world. Little John bellowed. It's been a long th- time since I've been a thorn in Nottingham's side. Robin added with relish. I'll get Fred Tuck started on the paperwork, said Little John. Good thinking, my large friend. Robin turned to the family. As for us, we have an appointment with my favorite sheriff. Fifty minutes later, Sabrina, Daphne, Granny Rhoda, Robin Hood, and Little John were pushing open the doors of the police station. The ugly little bodyguard, who Sabrina had learned was a miniature orc named Bartle, followed behind, darting into alleyways, blocking traffic, and rushing about, fully prepared to leap into combat to protect the group. Sabrina found him painfully annoying, but Granny refused to send him home. The police station was a mess. Boxes of... Uh, Boxes of files were scattered about. Many had been tipped over, rubbished through, and abandoned. There were big maps of the town and the walls, some covered in scribbled writing, and the front desk was stained with copy, coffee cup rings. That seems to be the end of this video. I'll see you later. Goodbye.